You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at HearstRanch.com. Hey everybody, this is Amuse News. I'm your host, RJ. I am bringing you a very special episode today. I am in the studio, the birthplace of HRN, at Roberta's in Bushwick, and I have not one, but two guests today. I guess first I'll just introduce my co-host, Amy Curry. Amy, how are you? Hi. I can't believe I'm here. I'm so excited to be part of Amuse News and to work with you and learn all about podcasting and be nice and bossy about my culinary background. <laughs> Amy has been an advisor to HRN and, and is now helping, helping me out. There's more to come on that. Um, but our other special guest, Christine D'Ercole, how would I do? <laughs> you did okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, there's a little roll of the R. <laughs> I missed the roll. Um, Christine is is joining us, um, and, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit about Christine's background in a second from Amy, but um, really excited to be here. We have pizza, we have stracciatella, we have mm. the gem salad, and um, one of the best one of the best meals and lunches we can we could have here. Oh, so. Yeah. Appreciate everybody joining us. Um, before we get into the conversation, I just want to give a quick plug for an event that we are doing next week, the 29th, in right outside of Philadelphia at the Ardmore Music Hall. Um, it's our 15th anniversary fundraising gala, but it's a it's a twist on your typical gala. We have two award-winning chefs who are going to be bringing a four-course menu and beverage pairing. Um, Eli Collins, who's from A Kitchen in Philly, was the 2022 James Beard semifinalist and Best of Philly chef, Randy Rucker, a 2024 James Beard nominated chef. Um, he, he has a restaurant River Twice. He's opening a new restaurant this year. He was a Best of Philly chef. And uh, Randy and Eli and all our bi- I are all big music fans. So we brought our friend Aaron Magner from the Disco Biscuits and Spaga to provide music. It's going to be an amazing night of conversation um, and music and food. And Eli Culp, who is of High Street Hospitality, he hosts Delicious City Philly podcast. He's going to be leading a conversation about the overlap between food and music and inspiration and cooking and playing music, and it's going to be a great night, and we would appreciate if you check it out. Um, you can go to heritageradionetwork.org slash feast or uh, check out one of my many posts in, on social about this event. So I think I'll leave it at that. Um, Amy, can you introduce us to our guest because you introduced me to our guest. Yeah, well, she is a friend and a hugely influencer, influential of a lot of things in my life. Um, mm. If you're not familiar with Christine, she is not a chef or a restaurateur, and she's not um, part of a food brand. She's a home cook, and she has a curiosity in the kitchen and a love of a great meal. Um, you might know Christine D. Ercole as a Peloton instructor, where she's one of the OG cycling instructors. Her classes are rooted in the science of cycling and the positive power of words. Her killer playlists from classic rock to new wave tell her origin story as a dancer, actor, and NYC bike messenger, fun fact, all leading up to now. 
Her mindful motivation is rooted in a powerful mantra, I am, I can, I will, I do, and I say that all day long when I'm on the Peloton, which carries through in everything she does, whether it's professional cycling or cooking at home with friends and family. Productive self-talk in the kitchen is confidence in the kitchen and can change the narrative on how and why we cook. We are so excited and honored to have you today, Christine. Thank you so much. It is my honor to be here, and I just cannot, I'm trying not to eat the pizza because I want to be able to talk, but that bee sting is bananas. It really is. Crazy. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, food. We talk about food. Well, yeah, well, I, I think I want to just your your message and, and what you talk about and, and what Amy described is so joyful and I think celebratory and just curious how that uh, plays out in the kitchen as it does on the on the bike. Well, curiosity, Amy, as you said, a curiosity in the kitchen. I uh, where to begin? I got myself a job cooking in a restaurant called Cafe Elsie on Forty Seventh and Tenth Avenue. Back in uh, 1991, I went to eat there and I said to the owner, I said, I, I really needed a job. I was messengering, but I also needed another job. Sorry, it was 95. And I said, I, I think I can make this and I've got some other things. I, I know I'm being completely forward and I have no training in the kitchen, but I really need a job. And can you like help me? And I, he said, yeah. And I learned a lot working in that kitchen. Um, and I lost where I was going. What, what, <laughs> ta- what kind of food was it? Oh, gosh. We would... Um, one of the things... Oh, curiosity in the kitchen. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I watched what they were making, and I, I noted what was on the menu and the combinations of spices and herbs and flavor combinations that I was like, oh, it made me think. I did never thought these things would go together. And then I had to cook one night, and I'm looking in the fridge, and it's a tiny little place, tiny, tiny little place. And I put chicken breast in the pan and filled it with orange juice red pepper and mint and baked it. I was like, I don't know what's going to (laughs) happen. And then I I can't remember the rest of it, but it came out so good. It was insane. I need to go back to that and see what I can do with that. Um, And then other simple things. I learned how to roast red peppers and tomatoes and then put them in the blender with raw garlic. And I didn't realize people ate raw garlic yeah. <laughs> at that point <laughs> in my life. Um, and made amazing things. Learned how to deglaze. Learned how to um, cook down. And um, that it was so powerful to have that curiosity in the kitchen because it completely changed my relationship with food and what I thought food could do and what food could be. Yeah. Because growing up as a dancer, my relationship with food was very controlled and uh, toxic. You can't eat this. You can't eat that. What is, you know, the whole, talk about the self-talk, the entire conversation I had with myself about what was placed in front of me went from, as a kid, being excited about macaroni and cheese casserole that my mom made to... I can't have that. I have to restrict that. And now, you know, I'm only eating the salad and there's no dressing and I'm having shredded wheat and skim milk and counting my grapes. And And how old were you when you were doing this? This was like from 13 to 17, 18, I started to shift out of it. Um, You know, I, my self-talk around food was horrible. I imagined everybody else was looking at what I was eating. Everybody else is judging. Nobody else is thinking about what you're eating, except for my grandfather, who called me a bottomless pit. And that always, that had stuck with me. That's very dangerous. Nobody should be commenting on what anybody else is eating or how much they're eating. Leave it alone. It is not the way or the place or the time. And... So I hurt myself. I hurt myself with food. I hurt myself with how I ate. I was deep in the trenches of self-harm. And something that started to change that 
relationship with food was when I was around 16, 17, my father started taking us out to fancy dinners. We were, we struggled for a while. We struggled for a good long time. But when he started to make money again, um, he would take us to dinner, Dueling Kurt's house, Stottsville Inn back in the 80s. Um, and this was in Pennsylvania? In Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dilworth Town Inn eventually went to Simon Pierce. I loved that restaurant. I don't think it's there anymore. And this one restaurant, I was 18 years old. My dad took a bite of duck with Bing cherries and his face changed. And he sat back and he put his fork and knife down and he took a breath and he closed his eyes (laughs) and he savored that bite. And I did not know food could do that. So, of course, I became incredibly curious about what did you just taste? And he gave me a bite, and the same thing happened to me. And I, I, I just was completely blown away at how those flavors came together, and what a sensory experience. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't even know how to describe it except to say I sat back, put my fork down, took a breath, and whoa. Um, and... That Christmas, they got. I started talking about food and like I want to cook in the kitchen. And what is this iceberg lettuce? Like, no, we must have other kinds of vegetables. There are all these other things, and we're not going to have frozen veal patties. We're going to like have the real thing. And by Christmas, they were like, okay, she's serious. And they got me a cast iron pan that I still cook in. The best pan. I um. They got me a Mundial knife. And they got me a walk. <laughs> and I took all these things to college with me. Um, and that, it, it, it started, it really, really changed my perception of what food could do. And the, the, the sensory joy, the sheer sensory joy of what happens in your mouth when certain flavors come together, suddenly food became exciting instead of me dreading it and then cooking with friends cooking for friends even like in college it was a can of tuna fish and ramen noodles and I would (laughs) add stuff to it in a pan and I remember being impressed with myself (laughs) and uh but then inviting friends over and talking about it and being excited about talking about food was a revelation. And, and so that's what gave you the confidence to go to the restaurant owner and say, Yeah, hey, I, can, I, I, I was like, I know I can make good things. Because I had moved beyond ramen and tuna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like, I mean, the way you're describing it, you had a kind of different relationship. But then once you changed it, it, it increased your confidence. Yeah. And it sounds like that yeah. set the foundation for how you think about Absolutely. Everything, it, is that right? It helped me get out of a dangerous place and turn it into a joyful place, which led to a really insane renovation on the kitchen of the house that we just bought three years ago. <laughs> oh my God. Which, which is now, is that now a dream kitchen? That's a dream kitchen. <laughs> that is an eight burner blue star. Yeah. With a big hood and a massive refrigerator and all these glass cabinets and the herringbone floor and the soapstone counters. It's just ridiculous. Every time I walk into my kitchen, I'm like, ah, yes. So where where do you, as your career has progressed and now you're obviously you're, you're biking and telling people about biking and cooking and doing everything else, where do you find that confidence on a daily basis? Because as you grow up, or in my experience, as you get older, it, it it ebbs and flows. Confidence. <laughs> Confidence. <laughs> well, so how I, do you how do you maintain that, or where do you find that? You know, that's a funny question because um, trust. It's trusting yourself. It's trusting yourself, and mm-hmm. I think that's a decision you make. You don't. It, it's to be able to trust yourself and just dis- decide. 
that you have you have an idea, you decide to follow it yeah. and explore. It's about playing. Mm. It's about playing and being curious. That when we're curious, when we enter a situation with curiosity, what can I do with this? What if I can do something with this? What if I only have these four ingredients? Play. Mm-hmm. The confident I think confidence comes from removing performance anxiety from any situation. Yeah. Uh, when you feel like you have to do something correctly or do something um, in a way that's going to be judged, then our confidence becomes eroded. But when we are playing and coming from a place of curiosity, you're free. Yeah. It's that the difference between... When you enter a new situation, we often judge ourselves. Yeah. We're afraid of doing it wrong. We're afraid of not getting it right. We're afraid of not, other people not liking it. And they're, I think, training our brains through managing how we talk to ourselves to remember to enter a situation with curiosity instead of judgment changes the playing field. And who cares what anybody thinks? And how can you create? How could any great chef create anything if they weren't playing and curious? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that that is like a counter, the counter to the curiosity is fear often. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I would observe, you know? Fear like, and the fear of judgment. Yeah. Of, of anything, which yeah. I think paralyzes a lot of people. Um, Absolutely. So when, when the, when your confidence is not where you want it to be, how do you, cause you're, you're, you have to, you have to do the performance part of, of <laughs> exuding confidence. And oh, probably, you mean in teaching, yeah, in class. Yeah, in teaching and in every, you know, that's like part of your mantra. Well, so I, I am confident in my knowledge of cycling yeah. <laughs> and fitness. How do you get yourself out of, um, a state of mind where you're not feeling confident? Well, you know, as a 53-year-old woman whose body's changing, um, I've had plenty of moments before I pull on my spandex and <laughs> get on stage and in front of a camera with, you know, anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand people. Um, I have had to decide, decide mm-hmm. to not judge myself. And I've been saying for a hundred years, encouraging people and myself to think bigger than a smaller pair of pants. Mm. We have to think bigger than a smaller pair of pants. We are so much more than our waistlines. Mm -hmm. We put all these metrics and numbers on the finish line, whether it's our bank account, our waistline, our scale. We're trying to make that number go down. We're trying to make our watts go up. And all like we just need to shut out the numbers. When you put the numbers to the side so that we can actually see ourselves mm. and find that our real weight, our real weight is in the weight of our words and our actions and how we impact other people with our words and our actions. And that. That gives me confidence and knowing that I don't need to waste time on wondering what anybody else thinks or what I think they think about my body. Mm -hmm. This was, this is what cycling gave me as a gift was when I was too big to be a ballerina, always told I was too big, wouldn't put me in a short tutu. Told me my thighs were so much bigger than the other girls. You know, you, we have to put you in the back row. We have to put you in a long skirt. Wow. And, and then when I started cycling and winning races, and I realized, oh, that's what these thighs were built for. I can win races. I can be proud of myself because of my body, mm-hmm. not because of someone's opinion of my body. That realization is an absolute turning point in my life that I could actually be built for something and that if I focused on getting really, really good at this thing that I have an inkling I'm good at, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that I don't need anybody else's... I don't need, nobody cares what you look like when you cross the finish line first. Yeah. Nobody cares how cute you are or how little or pretty or any of that. Yeah. 
What we care about is the actions, yeah. the decisions that got you across that finish line first. Or just got you across that finish line, yeah. period, yeah. in a race that you might have thought you didn't deserve to be in. I got plenty of those stories. <laughs> and that, changing that relationship with my body was also happening concurrently with this change of relationship with food. And um, I think that it's it, the, the world tells us so much about who we're supposed to be and why we can't be that and how much we have to change about ourselves in order to be the thing that the world tells us we're supposed to be. And it's all, am I allowed to say bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> you say, you say um, we have to unsubscribe. Yeah. Because that's a self-annihilating narrative. And it's everywhere. It's everywhere. We have to unsubscribe from it. And that means living our lives the way we want to live them. And it means turning off the <laughs> phone and not doom scrolling right. everything that's telling us that we're wrong. Well, and like you said, the numbers, it's it's if it's not weight, it's like you said, it's finances, it's likes, it's retweets, it's yes. followers, it's it, like Every number tells us value, if, yeah. if that's the way you look at it. And I, I guess exactly. my question is, how are you, it sounds like you're, I mean, it's a motivational mantra that you have. I am, I can, I will, I do. Well, li listen, this is, these words, they just came out of my mouth one day during a class, like almost 20 years ago. And it was spontaneous and it stuck. Mm-hmm. What I have learned about those words that I didn't realize at the time through the work that I've been doing, I, I do these workshops in self-talk called Word Shop, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we workshop our self-talk. If I handed you a transcript of everything you said to yourself in the course of a day, look at your face. Yeah. They can't see your face. Your eyebrows went up yeah. and you're like, oh, first of all, tell me, what do you imagine that would be like? It would be, well, it would certainly be much more negative than the way that I talk to my kids or my friends right. or my well, wife or anybody. anyone. Right. Right. We're much more critical of ourselves. Yes, we are. And not in a productive way, generally. You would also find, laced through that mess of sentences, that many of them begin with either I am, mm -hmm. I can, I will, or I do, in positive tentative and negative mm. lines of thought. Mm. Whether it's I am, I was, or wasn't, or I, I can, I could, I couldn't, I can't, I will, I would, I wouldn't, I won't, I do, I did, I didn't, I don't. In all of their forms, they form a roadmap yeah. about where we are, I am, what we think or believe we can or can't do about where we are, what we decide we will or won't do about where we are and what we can do about it. And finally, what actions we do take or don't about where we are in order to get where we want to go. Yeah. And in order to get where we want to go, like, let's say you call an Uber because you know where you want to go. Yeah. They can't get you unless you know where you are. You have to know your current location. Yeah. We spend a lot of time in this world avoiding seeing where we really are. We numb out with any number of things. We numb out with food. Yeah. We numb out with drink. We numb out with drugs. We numb out with Instagram. Yeah. We numb out with doom scrolling. We numb out with shopping. All of these things, these things that we do to avoid dealing with what's real about where we really are. And the work that I'm doing in addressing and recognizing our self-talk is about taking a look at where you are and someone when they finally take the moment to sit down and say okay I am actually really sad or really angry and I've been sitting on something for yeah. who knows how many years some unresolved thing well what can you do about it well I can't because I don't have the money or I'm afraid to take the risk I'm afraid to speak up so I can't for instance say I want a divorce mm -hmm. or I can't tell my mother what example, example, example yeah. goes on. I'm sure you can fill in the blanks a million times, but you can, <laughs> yeah. 
Like you could be afraid and you might not have the money at the moment, but you can do something yeah. about where you are Yeah. in order to get where you want to go. That's where curiosity comes in. Yeah. Deciding that you will do something is very scary. Yeah. All of these things are scary. Yeah. Yeah. It's uncomfortable stuff, but... You know, they say <laughs> change begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Yeah. But it, it is it's it is true that if we really want change in our lives, we want to live our best lives, we want to live our most fulfilled and actually joyful, yeah, productive lives where we feel like we have impact and we're proud of ourselves, then we got to look at where we are in order to get there. Because you can't get directions without knowing your current location. And when I realized that those words made that map, I, light bulbs. Yeah. Light bulbs went off. And I recognize, I have kept my journals. I, I have journals going back, like the little Holly Hobby journal, journal with the, like the lock on it. Um, and these sentences that start with these four prompts in all of these different forms are everywhere. And I go through and circle them. And I do this in, I have, generative writing in my uh, workshops and then I have them go back and circle all of those prompts. I did, they didn't even recognize the roadmap and we listen to that roadmap. Yeah. We listen to it, we live by it, we follow it as though we didn't have a choice, as though it was the only road we could take. And until we become aware of it, we're gonna keep like on a neural map, yeah. a neural path in our head, we're not going to change it until we become aware of it. When we become aware of it, we can interrupt that conversation that's been going one way for so long and change it and take a different path. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. One thing I find fascinating, thank you for going through that. It's really revelatory, I'm sure, to a lot of people, and, and definitely makes me think. One, one word you didn't say at all is should. You know, which is like I leave that a, one whole, out. a whole different It's a whole other can of because worms. Because I think that that's something that is, it's so dangerous, right? In, mm -hmm. in terms of probably getting in the way of that path. Yeah. You know, yeah. backwards looking or forwards looking, like you, if you start down that path, then you're, I think it's like an easy way to get stuck. A very easy way to get stuck. And we, we get stuck under the guise of politeness. Hmm. We do a lot of, I'm sorry, and, and asking someone's opinion, should I wear this or should I wear that? Because we want to include them yeah. in our thought process. But at, at the end of the day, like, these little, little things, should I wear these shoes or those yeah. shoes? Yeah, it could be like a fun conversation with your friend, but at the, if you really boil it down to the root, if we're, if we're doing that all the time and can't make a decision by ourselves that's something we need to be aware of and if we are playing around then be aware that we're doing that yeah yeah and this isn't about controlling your mind all the time it's about being more mindful and less mindless it's the only way yeah um, thank you for that. That's a powerful mantra. And I, I, I need to switch gears because I want to talk about music. Let's talk because about music. I love as a, as a music oh, person. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, like, first of all, I, I know that a lot of the rides that you do are, are thematic. So you, mm -hmm. you know, you go down that path, but it's almost like as a music, if you 
if you like music in the way that I think you do, it's probably yeah. can be paralyzing probably to like, where do I, <laughs> where do I start? Because you think about the peaks and the valleys and oh the God, climax yeah. of the ride and, yeah. um, how do you, how mm, do that's you, so good. Sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. <laughs> that's the stretch. That's the stretch teller. Um, how do you oh approach, how do you approach the playlist and what do you think about when you're putting music together? Because <laughs> it seems hard, but also really fun. Oh my God. It's so intense. <clears throat> So, as a cyclist, knowing that there's a range of cadences that, depending on the resistance, will produce a certain physiological adaptation if you spend enough time there with the appropriate recovery, I'm always looking for songs that are going to match the cadence ranges that I want. Now, if that's all I had to do, easy peasy. Yeah. But I got to like the song. Mm-hmm. And as someone who loves music, you know you want to play the same song again and again and <laughs> again. Right. There's something right. in that. And yeah. actually, that's another whole conversation about how powerful the recognition of music is, mm -hmm. the power of nostalgia, and the power as we get older and if our minds are starting to not function optimally, that music can help us reconnect in yeah. our brains. That's a side story. Yeah. Um, but I'm also looking for lengths of music that I can Tetris together with a crossfade that's going to fit into 44 minutes. Yeah. Because the class is 45 minutes, but I got to start your cool down at 44 minutes. Now I can start it a little bit early, but I really shouldn't start it late. Yeah. Because I need you to catch your breath after... I've pushed you across the finish line and I'll ask for music requests because I also want to know what other people love. Everybody who loves a song yeah. has a relationship yeah, with that yeah, song. Absolutely. And I might not have that relationship with that song, but if you have a relationship with that song, that means you heard something. I'm curious about what you heard. So I'm always asking people for what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. I might not like it, yeah. but, <laughs> but I want to know, I want to hear and give it a chance. Again, curiosity. Yeah. Tetrising together the songs in a structure that gives me a flat road and intervals and a build for a warm up and then whatever structure, I'm always desperately trying to make the the length of the song match the effort. Mm -hmm. Or at least for it to finish at a moment where you're not in a zone five or zone six effort yeah. and, and the song drops off in the middle of the effort. Yeah. The, what a buzzkill. Yeah. That, oh, I can It's like being not. a DJ on a dance floor in that right. way, right? Yeah. They've got the songs, what you want them to move into each yeah. other, whether it's beautifully or it's with humor. Mm -hmm. Like the other day, I needed to fill 20 seconds mm -hmm. in order to make everything else work. And I'm, I'm looking for a needle in a haystack. Yeah. I need 20 seconds. Yeah. Uh, it's zone one, it's recovery, it's easy, it's yeah. like you're catching your breath, so it doesn't have to be rhythmically tied mm -hmm. to the cadence. And I, I found um, a sample of Queen's Flash Gordon. Wow. And I was like, it's like so out of left field, <laughs> and all of a sudden the room here is Flash! Yeah. Ah, Masters of the Universe. Um, and it was funny, and that's great. Yeah. The, but that's like, I'll use music in that way yeah. in order to to make all those other punctuated moments. You want to get to the top of the hill and it goes, boom. Yeah. And there's, um, well, New Wave is my really, like, yeah. New Wave and 90s rock. Yeah. Classic rock. Yeah. Is my... Yeah, I've done those. I've done those rides. And I think you can tell as a, as a writer, um, am I a writer? Is that what you as call a writer, it? Yeah. yes. I'm a writer. Yeah. Um, you can tell the people who are teaching, who have the connection to the music. And, and then I think there are times where people who, it's like, it's, it's, it's background or it's mm -hmm. part of the. Right. But when you, you can tell when there's like a connection because then when it, when it hits at the exact right time, it's, it's oh. powerful. It's really powerful. Oh my gosh. I've had a couple like very emotional moments when yeah. songs start and you're like, this is perfectly placed, you know? Thank you. It's awesome. I spend a lot of time on that. A lot of time. So is that part of your, is that like a huge part of how you spend your time? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I wish it was more efficient, but um, I'm I'm pretty dedicated to creating a soundtrack to an experience. Yeah. And while I know not everybody's gonna like every song I play, I think it's important to me that I frame, like the song has a purpose. Yeah. Whether it's the feeling of the song or the lyrics in the song, as you know, I'll often say, I'll stop talking and say, listen to this. Yeah. And when we have artist series, I wanna support that artist. I don't wanna give you a Wikipedia yeah. I want to give you a good workout. That's the first thing we're there for, mm-hmm. is the workout. Mm-hmm. Um, supported by good music and good storytelling. Yeah. I could tell you, you know, you got five minutes to get to the top of this. I set you up with your goal. I say something that's meaningful to you. And I can leave you to go do that. Yeah. And I don't have to, like, go, 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 go. Yeah. The whole, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for going into that. Um, okay, I, I guess let's go back to food for for the last couple minutes. Um, is there a recipe that you have loved cooking recently, or a recipe that you've tried and didn't work? It didn't work. <laughs> Once um, I made a, a cheesecake. I tried to make a cheesecake, wow. and um, what I made was like an omelet. <laughs> <laughs> I can see how that could happen. I don't know what I did wrong, and in fact, this is funny. We ordered food in last night, and the, I ordered the cheesecake, a slice of cheesecake for, the, for dessert, and I took a bite, and I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is so funny that you asked me, because I didn't connect it until now, but the, it was that same texture. Uh, it's like this, they did this wrong. Yeah. And that, that was the same wrong thing that I did to my cheesecake like 10, 15 years ago. Um. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that doesn't sound... It didn't work it doesn't out. Sound baking good. is like, I do a lot of baking. My daughter and I bake a cake every single birthday. Okay. We often do one at Thanksgiving and one at Christmas mm-hmm, too. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll bake some. It's a thing we do. And talk about, you know, storytelling yeah. and food. That is a story between us. Every year we bounce set, um, recipes back and forth. What do you want to make this year? And we've made some incredible, incredible. Yeah. Champagne cake was one of the best things. Wow. Last year we did um, Pavlova cake. Wow. Yeah. This isn't just like. You know, oh, cake. no, this no, isn't going... like grocery store. Yeah, no, yeah, this you're... is like sift the flour. Wow. We're not playing. That's really cool. And it's cool to create that ongoing connection with food. Yes. Right? Um, is there any, th- any recipe that you're loving or, or a meal that you had recently that you want to share? Well, that I cooked or that somebody else cooked? Either. Either or both. Okay. So, um, for Brian's birthday, my husband's birthday, I messaged my friend Lee Chismar and his wife Erin and I they own this amazing restaurant oh, called yeah. Belite yeah. in um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania yeah, you mentioned them okay. yeah, because yeah. they're amazing and I texted him and asked him for recommendations for like a whole pig roast because I know that that is my husband loves nose to tail mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm a little like I'm a, I'll tiptoe around that yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's all it's, it's in intense, yeah. really anything and um, he gave me some recommendations. He's like, I also would happy be happy to. I'm like, are you? you but what about the restaurant? Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm good. <laughs> I was like, yes. Oh my god, I'm gonna have him. He's gonna come to get. So he did a whole barbecue, smoked everything, brisket, all of wow. this. The uh, co- Korean. Um, oh my god, I can't even. All of the things he made, all of the pickles. All the, and then he made these uh, barbecue sauces out of beet. Ah. Beet barbecue sauces, which were insane. And all I can, I, all I can think of is like he, he needs to like bottle those mm-hmm. and get them on the grocery <laughs> store shelf because they were so good. I nursed them for weeks afterwards. Wow. In fact, I packaged almost all of the leftovers. We had like 20-something people over. Mm-hmm. Then I let people take some food, but I... <laughs> It's like, don't yeah, take it all. Yeah, back. Um, and we took it 
to South Carolina with us. We drove 10 hours to South Carolina with all this food in a cooler oh. and ate leftovers for the week. Do um, they check your trunk for barbecue when you go into right. South Carolina? <laughs> I feel like there's like no, no out-of-state barbecue allowed. No out-of-state That's amazing. barbecue. That's amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Wow. It was it was an outstanding meal. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think I think that's it. I think we're going to wrap up. Um, Amy, thank you so much for bringing us together. And Christine, thank you for spending thank time you. here. Roberta's with us. This is really fun. Hope you come what back at some point. What a pleasure. I will. Absolutely. And we'll continue eating in the meantime. I'm going to eat this. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else, thank you for listening. And um, we'll put information for Christine in the show notes, of course, but you probably already know her. But if you don't, you should. And thank you for uh, spending time with us. Thank you.